In this part of our course, we are going to study relativistic quantum mechanics. This is something which we should have studied as part of our formal course that is during the semester. But given the difficulties of online teaching and learning, we have not been able to complete all that we wanted to, to do during the semester itself. So these are supplemental lectures which should give you a full idea about what the course should have looked like in an ideal situation. The major reason why I am putting forward these lectures is that these topics are going to be very important in many of the coming courses that you are likely to take. So please pay attention to this part because without them some of the topics that you are going to study in later semesters will become very difficult to comprehend. So now that we know that this is about relativistic quantum mechanics, let us first take a look at the quantum mechanics that we have all known and hopefully loved. That is, the quantum mechanics in which the central role is played by Schrodinger's equation. As you all know, Schrodinger's equation is a non-relativistic equation. In fact, if you look at the form of the equation, minus h cross square by twice and plus n psi plus v of x psi equals i h cross del psi del t, it is obvious that space and time are on very different footings here. This is second order in space, first order in time, and hence any transformation which mixes space and time together on an equal footing or equalish footing as relativity does will not keep this equation covariant. Another way to look at the non-relativistic origins of this equation is just to look at the fact that this is, crudely speaking, just something which you get out of p square by twice m plus v of x equal to e, which is the classical non-relativistic energy conservation equation. And in that, you realize that for the quantum situation, p is given by h cross k and e is given by h cross omega where omega and k are, of course, fi angular frequencies and wave vectors of the corresponding wave. By the standard trick that follows from the differentiation of an exponential, we know that the substitution's p vector going over to h cross by i grad and e going over to i h cross del del t work. So once we do these substitutions in the equation, we immediately end up with the Schrodinger equation. This of course is not a proof of the Schrodinger's equation, but it is a sort of heuristic quote unquote derivation of the same. At the very least, it emphasizes a non-relativistic structure at the center of this equation. Now if you think about this a bit, this is a bit strange given the fact that the birth of quantum mechanics was essentially through the study of black body radiation and hence light. Light, after all, is the most non-relativistic thing that there is in the universe. Indeed, if you look at the history of quantum mechanics, the theory which de Broglie put forward of particle waves was essentially based on the then rather new relativistic calculations. In fact, he was praised strongly by the PhD committee on his very adroit use of relativistic concepts. Although, frankly, the PhD committee was also of the opinion that this work is useless and had de Broglie not been the cousin of a prince of Monaco, he might very well have missed out on his PhD. Leaving that aside, the question really is that here is a subject which was born essentially through light, the most relativistic of all things, and yet, its basic equation is non-relativistic. So, didn't Schrodinger realize that his theory should be relativistic? Let's explore that in today's lecture. The answer to this is, Schrodinger was very well aware that his theory should have been relativistic. In fact, he had formulated the relativistic version of his famous equation. Alongside the more famous or better known non-relativistic version that we just looked at, and this is the equation that we call the Klein-Gordon equation. Well, Schrodinger was the one who got it first, but because of some difficulties that we are going to outline in this lecture, Schrodinger sidelined 
that particular equation and focus more on his non relativistic version and this is the reason why his name is not assigned to this particular equation in where the relativistic equation was proposed independently of Schrodinger in the same year 1926 by several people Gordon Falk Klein Tudor then another article by Gedonder and Van Dungen and all of them essentially gave us the same equation. The approach taken by Schrodinger as well as all these workers were rather similar. All they did was start from the relativistic energy momentum relation for a free particle instead of e square by twice m equal to e which is the non-relativistic version of e square equal to c square p vector square plus m square c to the 4. Of course the e here is not just the kinetic energy but kinetic energy plus the rest energy. Now by carrying out the standard substitution e is replaced by i h cross del del t and p is replaced by minus i h cross grad they all ended up with this particular equation minus h cross square del 2 phi del d2 that's e square phi must be equal to minus h cross square c square Laplacian of phi plus m square c to the 4 phi. This equation as you can see is second order in both space and time and in fact has the derivatives in a very particular combination if you divide through by minus h cross square c square and bring everything to one side this equation can be replaced by a very compact form box plus mu square acting on phi is zero the box is a four dimensional generalization of the laplacian that also called the delambertian and is given by one by c square del 2 del t2 minus laplacian mu this parameter is simply the mass in inverse length units it's actually m times c by h cross Now notice that the box, this four-dimensional differential operator that we have, four-dimensional generalization of the Laplacian, is actually invariant under Lorentz transformations. Which is why this particular equation is one which respects not only Lorentz but also Poincaré transformations. That is, if you replace x by x prime, where x prime is lambda x plus a, where lambda is a Lorentz transformation matrix. A is just a constant 4 vector. So the Poincare transformation is you carry out a Lorentz transformation and then you translate. If you do this, box will not change. That's very easy to actually check. Mu square, of course, is a number, it doesn't change. In order that this equation be covariant, in fact, in this particular case, it's actually invariant under the Poincare transformation, you must demand that phi has to be a scalar field. That is, once you do the coordinate transformation x replaced by x prime phi must be replaced by a new function phi prime such that phi prime at x prime must be the same as phi at x and if you do that then the equation will be equally valid in the primed coordinate replacing x by x prime all the derivatives in the box will get replaced and phi by phi prime this new equation will look exactly the same as the old equation so the equation does not change when you go from one observer to another connected to each other by a Poincaré transformation. There is one point which has to be stressed here. It's a rather obvious point but sometimes it leads to a bit of confusion. Since phi is a scalar field, what you are really saying is the value of the new function which describes the field at the transform point must be equal to the value which the old function takes at the original point which is simply a statement that the scalar will not change when you do a Lorentz transformation. The scalar will not change but remember because the label of the space time point x has changed to x prime the function phi will actually change. In fact phi will change to a new function phi prime whose value at x is given by phi at the point which transformed into x under the Poincaré transformation that is you have to apply the inverse Poincaré transformation on x to get that point and it's very easy to see that this is nothing but 
lambda inverse acting on x minus a. Remember the Poiré transformation is first do a Lorentz, then translate. To invert that, you have to first negate the translation, invert the translation, and then apply the inverse Lorentz transformation. This particular result about the way in which a scalar field transforms is actually very, very important and will be very useful in many aspects of the theory later on. So this is something which I wanted to point out. Phi prime x prime is phi of x, but that does, doesn't mean that the function phi doesn't change. The function phi does change in a very particular way. So now we have an equation which is Lorentz as well as Poincaré covariant. So is perfectly consistent with special relativity and marries that to quantum mechanics in a rather nice fashion. But the question that we should immediately ask is, what exactly is the interpretation of this quantity phi? Now, let me just briefly remind you of what we did in the non-relativistic case, where we tried to find an interpretation for the wave function psi. And as you are all aware, this was a probabilistic interpretation where psi was related to the probability amplitude of measuring the position of a particle. So the probabilistic interpretation of quantum mechanics, let's look at the non-relativistic case just to sort of get a flavor of what we are going to do for the relativistic case later. You must all remember the derivation. I'm just quickly going through it. You start with the Schrodinger equation written down for psi. Then you write down this complex conjugate version. The bar on top of psi here indicates complex conjugate of psi. So that's the equation in orange. And the next step is familiar to all of you. You multiply the first of these two equations, the original Schrodinger equation by psi bar, the second equation by psi, subtract the two and you end up with the equation in red shown below. The Vx psi bar psi term cancels out and you are left only with derivatives, in a sense, Laplacian combinations on the left and del del t is on the right. It's very easy to see that the term on the right inside the bracket is del del t of psi bar psi. And again, it should be very familiar from first year vector analysis, the psi bar Laplacian psi minus psi Laplacian psi bar is actually a divergence. And by replacing that and dividing through by the ih cross, we get ih cross by twice term divergence of psi bar grad psi minus psi grad psi bar is del del t of psi bar psi, which again should be very familiar to all of you, is something you can replace by del rho del t plus divergence of j equals zero. This is nothing other than the, than the continuity equation, which tells us that this quantity rho is a density of a conserved quantity. In other words, if you integrate rho over a region, the only way that integral can change is by flowing out from the surface of that region. And of course, if you have taken the region large enough, maybe all of space, then there is nothing that can flow out because j will vanish at infinity. And then the total integral of rho over all space k is conserved. This helps us to interpret rho as a probability density. Because now you can say that if you initially start out with a particle whose net probability of being found somewhere is 1, the probability stays 1 as time goes by. The particle doesn't suddenly go away. It stays there forever. Well, the rho is, of course, our old friend Shai bar Shai and j, this probability current vector, is given by h cross by twice mi Shai bar grad Shai minus Shai grad Shai bar. The i has switched from the numerator to the denominator simply because of the change of sign which you have when you move to from one side to the other. All this is very familiar and you all know that this is why psi bar psi could be used as a probability density and this interpretation makes perfect sense in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Also given the fact that psi bar psi is positive definite, there is no bar to interpreting that as a probability density. Let us now go on and take a look at what happens to the same considerations when we start with the relativistic equation, namely the equation that should have been called perhaps the Schrodinger, Klein, Fock, Gordon, blah, 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 lots of other names equation, but it's just called the Klein-Gordon equation. Let's take a look at that. 
The steps that you can carry out here are very, very similar. You start with the Klein-Gordon equation, the one in black. Then you write down the complex conjugate version of the equation. That's the one with phi bars. Of course, there's no i in this equation. So all that happens is the phi's become phi bars. Everything else stays the same. And then you multiply the first equation, the equation in black by phi bar, the equation in blue by phi, subtract the two, and you end up with this statement that 1 by psi t square times phi bar del 2 phi del t 2 minus phi del 2 phi bar del t 2, which is del del t of phi bar del phi del t minus phi del phi bar del t, is related to a total divergence, divergence of phi bar grad phi minus phi grad phi bar. And now, just by rewriting things a bit, just by putting in the h cross by twice our mi factor in front, well, you need the factor essentially to make sure that when you take the non-relativistic limit, you get back your Schrodinger equation results. You once again can write the Klein-Gordon equation or derive from the Klein-Gordon equation the continued equation del rho del t plus divergence of j equals 0 and a rho, the probability density, is ih cross by twice mc square phi bar del phi del t minus phi del phi bar del t and j is simply our old friend h cross by twice i mi phi bar grad phi minus phi grad phi bar. Now notice that in the special case when we are talking of an energy eigenstate where ih cross del phi del t is e phi, you just plug that in into this expression Rho simply works out to be, after a simple bit of manipulation, this quantity, E by mc square times phi bar phi. And now, once we go over to the non-relativistic limit, where E is almost mc square, the kinetic energy is very small compared to the rest energy, so total energy is just mc square, becomes simply phi bar phi, which is exactly analogous to what we had in the non-relativistic case. This, of course, is what justifies the IH cross by twice MC square factor in front of rho. Also, gratifying is the fact that once we put in the same factor, the expression for J essentially looks the same as in the non-relativistic case. Well, so far, so good. We have a relativistic equation which embodies the basic ideas of quantum mechanics. We also have a nice equation of continuity del rho del t plus divergence of j equals 0. So it seems that we should be able to interpret this equation in the same way as we had our non relativistic version, where psi bar psi stood for the probability density. Here we have a rho which is not psi bar psi, but it's ih bar by twice m six by phi bar del phi del t minus phi del phi bar del t, which will serve as our probability density. Uh, note, of course, that the term in the bracket is purely imaginary, being the difference between a complex number and its complex conjugate. So with the i in front, rho becomes real. So there's no problem with a complex or imaginary rho here. However, the important point here is that although rho for a phi which satisfies i h cross del phi del t equals e phi, that is a plane wave kind of phi, is positive definite, as you have seen, is e by mc square times phi by phi. In general, rho may not be positive definite. After all, the Klein-Gordon equation is a second order differential equation in time, which means that at any given instant of time, you can set phi and del phi del t independently. And there is nothing in the equation itself which prevents you from choosing such phi and del phi del t that ends up giving you a negative rho or a rho which is not positive definite everywhere. Indeed, as you will soon see, even waves which satisfy ih cross del phi del t equal to e phi can give you solutions where e is actually negative. And hence, rho for such waves will be negative throughout. However, if rho is to be interpreted as a probability density, that is, rho times d cube x is going to be the probability of finding a particle in that small region d cube x, that rho has to be positive everywhere. 
This is something which the rho that we have derived from the klein gordian equation does not have. And it is primarily for this reason why that Schrodinger had actually abandoned this equation, did not push forward with it. Not only Schrodinger, all the other initial practitioners that we listed a while ago gave up on this equation for a few years and it was only revived by Pauli and Weisskopf in 1934 when they re-established its validity as an equation in quantum field theory. That is an equation where phi is not to be treated as a wave function for a single point particle but as a quantum field which describes a many particle system. Quantum field theory is out of the scope of this course, but this is something which you are going to learn about in the very next semester. The klein gordon equation actually is a starting point for the quantum field theory of scalar fields. So it is very important to be aware of what this equation really says, despite the fact that it was a bit of a failure as an equation for a single point particle, which was our initial aim. Another problem that the klein gordon equation suffers from, at least apparently suffers from, when interpreted as an equation for a single point particle, is that it allows negative energy solutions. Now come to think about it, this should not be too much of a surprise. After all, the basic relativistic equation from which we quote unquote derived the klein gordon equation was E squared equals P squared C squared plus m square times 4. So basically it's an equation for the square of E. So both the positive square root of P square C square plus m square times 4 and the negative square root of the same quantity should satisfy the klein gordon equation, which means it should give you both positive energy and negative energy solutions. Now, of course, this is something which is all very much possible even in the classical, that is non-quantum case, because the moment you start from E square equals P square C square plus M square C plus 4, you get both positive energy and negative energy solutions. However, in the non-quantum case, the situation is quite straightforward. The energy can either be bigger than MC square or less than minus MC square. And because of this big gap of twice MC square, in the allowed ranges of energy, a particle which starts out with positive energies something more than mc square can never end up having negative energies. So we can safely start with our, all our particles with positive energies by definition and forget about negative energy states completely when we are not doing quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is a slightly different story. But before we go there, let us take a look at the solutions of the klein gordon equation in some detail and check that we really do have negative energy solutions. Now, the simplest solutions to the klein gordon equation are simply wave-like solutions. That is, solutions of the form e to the power minus i by h bar p mu x mu, where p mu x mu, the inner product of the energy momentum four vector p mu and the position four vector x mu, is defined as p0 x0 minus p vector dot x. Note that we are using the metric plus minus 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 which is why p0 x0 comes with a plus sign and p1 x1, p2 x2, p3 x3 comes with minus signs. The h bar in the exponent is simply there to ensure that the exponential is dimension. The exponent is dimensionless. Let me just remind you that p0 is basically e by c and p vector of course is a 3 momentum vector here. Now, what we want to do is check under what conditions does a wave function like this satisfy the klein gordon equation? To do that, what we will do is we will plug this into the klein gordon equation. The first term, of course, is 1 by c squared del 2 del t 2. And when that acts on e to the minus i by h cross p mu x mu, of course, it only acts on a term which has t in it, that is the p0 x0 term, which of course is p0 ct, x0 being ct. And by a simple calculation, uh, apart from the 1 by c square factor outside, what this does is, is takes a factor of minus i by h cross times p0c out of phi and we are doing it twice. 
because of the double differentiation. So you get square of that. And when you plug everything in, you end up with P0 by h cross whole square phi with a minus sign. That's the first term in the Klein Gordon equation. That is rather the first part of the box in the Klein Gordon equation. The other part of the box is minus Laplacian. Uh, it is a minus i by h cross p mu x mu. Again, the Laplacian is going to act only on the spatial part, that is only on the part which has p dot x in it. And a very straightforward calculation will tell you that the result is p square by h cross square times phi. Now, if, if we put these things back in the Klein Gordon equation, the equation becomes minus p0 whole square by h cross square plus p square by h cross square plus m square c square by h cross square phi equals 0. That, remember, is our Klein Gordon equation because mu, which is there in this equation, is defined to be mc by h cross. So you can easily see that this thing will satisfy the Klein Gordon equation provided p0 whole square is given by p vector square plus m square c square, which will make the bracket here vanish. Phi being an exponential, of course, cannot vanish. So the product is zero only if the bracket vanishes. And this translates to e square equals c square p0 square. And that gives us the familiar formula back p vector square c square plus m square c to the 4. And as I have said before, this tells us that a wave-like solution will be there for the Klein Gordon equation provided the energy for the wave is related to the momentum by the relation E equals either plus square root of C square P vector square plus M square C to the 4 or minus the same square root. So either sign of the square root actually leads to a solution to the Klein Gordon equation. And this is to be expected because the Klein Gordon equation is invariant under all Lorentz transformations, including the time reversal transformation, which ch just changes the sign of the zeroth component. So it changes p0 to minus p0. So if a function with a positive p0 is a solution, a function with a negative p0 is also a solution. So this leads us to an inescapable conclusion. Negative energy states do exist among solutions of the Klein Gordon equation. And this is not a surprise. All relativistic systems must obey this condition E square equals P square C square plus M square C to the 4 for single particles. And so a single particle can have both a positive and a negative energy solution. As we had explained before, these negative energy solutions is not a problem for a classical, that is non-quantum theory, simply because of the big energy gap from minus mc square to plus mc square, where there are no allowed possible energies. But in quantum mechanics, the possibility of tunneling is very much there. A positive energy solution might very well tunnel and end up in a negative energy solution over time. And once it ends up with a negative energy, it can keep on losing energy forever, releasing an infinite amount of energy and ultimately itself going into negative infinite energy. Now this would be catastrophic for the real world, so we expect something or the other to prevent this from happening. Now this is considered to be another major shortcoming of the Klein Gordon equation. We already have this problem that the wave function, which is a solution to this equation, defines something like a probability density, but which cannot be a probability density because it's not positive definite. Now we see that this equation also allows negative energy solutions to exist. And these together were the real reason why Schrodinger had abandoned this equation. And all the rest of its originators had also sort of given up on this until, as I said before, Pauli and Weisskopf came into the scene. Now, usually what I would have done is just moved on from this point and moved on to the next step to a more acceptable relativistic quantum mechanics equations. And abandon the Klein Gordon equation right here until perhaps we come to the field theoretic description of the Klein Gordon equation somewhere later. However, since this is a supplemental lecture series, I would like to go beyond the bare minimum a bit and delve a bit deeper into the Klein Gordon equation, its possible role as a single particle wave equation. We will see that at least for free particles, 
we can actually create a structure within which we can describe single particle states which are solutions to the klein gordon equation however as we will also see this will break down the moment we bring in interactions in a meaningful way one of the important reasons why i want to talk about this is that some of the techniques that we will be learning here will actually be quite useful when you go ahead and study the klein gordon equation in its field theoretical version so you can think of these calculations as a sort of prelude to those so we will cover these topics in the next couple of lectures maybe for the time being let me sign off today